What's going on, everybody? This is Lewis Beck. Welcome to 343 TV, and specifically to Hybrid Home Studio. Uh, first of all, thanks everyone for, you know, being patient with um, my schedule and like things having to be moved around, you know, because my wrist was a little messed up. But uh, from now on, we're going to be streaming every Wednesday at 1 p.m., so be sure to tune in. Um, for those of you who may be tuning in for the first time, welcome. For those of you who are returning, welcome back. We really appreciate your support. Um, we've been building an amazing community at 343 Labs over the past year and a half, and despite the pandemic, there have been so many uh, great new faces that we've become acquainted with and a lot of cool people that we've started connecting with on the stream. Speaking of which, if you want to get in contact today, please, please, please lob a uh, little message into the stream. I'm going to be monitoring it from my cellular device, and I'm going to be doing my best job to uh, make sure that any questions that you have, I will be answering. So um, with that being said, real quick, a little bit on 343 Labs, right? Uh, we are a music production school based in New York City and also in Berlin. Uh, Berlin opened up recently over the summer and it's doing really, really well. Really, really cool. So if you're over there, by all means, please check us out. And if you're here in New York City, as you're obviously aware, things are a little complicated with the lockdown and the pandemic and everything. But we are actually offering in-person classes, um, limited in scope, of course, and abiding by social distancing policies and everything. Everyone's wearing a mask. Um, so if you're interested, definitely go check out our website. Uh, we also offer online classes in uh, all the stuff that we offer classes in in person as well all right and so we offer classes in logic ableton mixing mastering synthesis songwriting uh, composition and arrangement all sorts of things um anyway yeah you know if you've been tuning in and you're digging the content that we have please please hit the subscribe button and um if you're new and you're just watching today and you think you like what you see also hit the subscribe button because we have a ton of uh, really amazing instructors and skilled professionals that are constantly um, that we're st streaming every week. In fact, last week we had Christian Smith, who's the techno legend, which is super cool, um, you know. And so I'm sure there will be some more notable guests over the course of this season of 343 TV. Now, for those of you who were here last week, you might remember that we were working on um, synthesis, right? How to create sound, <laughs> which is what synthesis means. How to, um, but how to do it like in a hybrid way, right? So how to do it um, by using analog and digital, right? The combination of the two. So today, what I'm actually gonna be doing is I'm gonna be talking a little bit about what I'm gonna call mixing on the fly. So what exactly does that mean, first of all? Well. Let's talk about just what mixing is to begin with, right? This is a really um, misunderstood concept, right? People think it involves like super complex applications of equalization and compression and all sorts of crazy stuff, right? And that's what you have to do to get your record to sound professional. Uh, the truth is, is that's, you know, not really the case. More often than not, uh, mixing really is more related to the actual arrangement and the composition um, and the quality of the sounds that you've either recorded or chosen or created, right? And so equalization and compression are really just tools to be used to um, fix a lot of those problems, to fix problems when those things that you've done haven't been the right choices, haven't been there. You haven't, like, you know, chosen the right sound, or if you haven't, if your composition is a little bit of a mess, right? Anyway, all that being said, let's just jump right into it. And so... What I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be actually composing a song uh, from scratch. But what I'm going to do is is I'm going to um, demonstrate how I am kind of envisioning the final product before I actually, um, or rather while I'm making it, right? So that I don't have to spend as much time at the end focusing on it. And I'm going to talk about like what steps the process you should be prioritizing um, versus what things you might want to actually leave for genuinely like a mixing stage, right? So uh, as always, if you're here, please lob a, a little hello into the chat. 
and um, yeah, I'll, we'll get going. All right, so let's see. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to actually make a uh, house music track, like a dance track, maybe, maybe techno, I don't know, house or techno, we'll see. Um, and I'm going to combine using um, kick drums that I'm going to, like, sorry, a drum kit that I'm going to record, and also a track that, uh, and some um, samples, rather. What's going on, Andrew Duke? Welcome. All right, so let's make like a really like groovy, maybe down tempo, loungy kind of vibe. So I'm gonna go to 115 BPM, and I'm gonna plug in my TR8, which is right in front of me, which I love to use as the source for pretty much all my drums. And I'm gonna start first by um, just getting a good kick drum, right? And so we'll talk about kind of like what you may or may not be doing to get a good kick drum in the mix and how you're gonna wanna start off just like with that solid kick and how to do that. So I'm just gonna track a 909 kick here on the TR8, cause that is very, very kind of the quintessence of um, house music. All right, so let's see. Now, as always, what I'm going to do is, at the start of my project, right, is I'm going to come into my project settings in Logic, and I'm going to go into MIDI, and I'm going to go into, sorry, synchronization, MIDI, and then I'm going to sync my going to sync my drum machine with Logic, so that when I hit play, Now, you guys tell me if those levels are good in the uh, stream. I'm going to turn up a little my studio. All right. So first of all, I'm just going to try to get the right tone that I want. That's a pretty solid starting point for that kick drum. I'm thinking what I might do is turn up gain of input a little. There we go. All right. So all that I'm doing is I'm just tracking the uh the uh, TR8 with the 909 kick drum in. So let's call this kick. And first I'm just gonna hit record, all right? And since this is a house record, I don't need to like get tons of variation in that kick drum. What's cool about the TRA is it has what's called analog circuit behavior technology, which means that it kind of models the process of um, like not perfectly identical sound wave reproduction. Now, something that can happen sometimes is that it'll actually the 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 uh, transient will actually start a little bit sooner than the recording, and it'll get cut off and create a snipping noise. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and zoom in. You can do this in Ableton as well, and just get right to the spot of the transient and then line it up with the start of the project. I'll just loop that out right now. So that, let's talk about what you actually want to look for in a kick drum when you are trying to make a house record especially. Um, so, 
first of all, what you usually want, right, is some sort of snappiness to the kick. Now, that's not saying that you have to, right? A lot of the times, it's really nice to get, like, a uh, kick drum that's a little bit more, like, let's call it warm and, like, underwater sounding in some sense, where if you were to do a low-pass filter... Now, you could do stuff like that, right? With a sample that you find. Um, or a sample that you track, in this case, what I've done. But to be honest, it's on, I really think it's, it's a really bad practice to apply low-pass or high-pass filtering. Well, especially low-pass filtering um, to a kick drum sample that you find on the internet or that you, you know have from a sample pack. Main reason being that you introduce distortion resonant and like increased resonance which is honestly quite unpleasant um and it's gonna especially sound really bad on a laptop speaker um and a phone speaker when you create a low pass filter so if you want to like get rid of some of the high frequencies and some of the snappiness for your own taste right it's better to do a shelf it's a little bit smoother something really smooth and so then even this spot right here now gets accentuated a little bit much really this area actually so like I would reduce that a little and so when I'm mixing on the fly right What's up, Tyra? Welcome, and welcome from New Orleans. Love New Orleans. So when I'm talking about mixing on the fly, what I'm talking about is preparing the each item that I'm recording to fit into the mix in the most proper way as I'm kind of going, right? So what I'm doing is, is I'm not like spending tons of time getting involved in the nitty gritty. I'm just kind of quickly doing little provisional edits, right? So that... Um, little provisional adjustments so that anything that feels like it can be a little bit tighter or warmer or cleaned up a little, right? And to make space for other things that I'm doing that. Now, I'm not really going to continue to mess with this. But the thing to be aware of when you're EQing, right? And doing stuff like this is that you're you're messing with the spectral balance. And so what ends up happening is that these frequencies, which when I turn off the EQ, really aren't a problem at all. They become more apparent when we reduce the high frequencies because the actual tonal balance gets removed. So I'm not going to EQ, but I just wanted to point out that EQing a kick drum with low pass filtering is not the greatest idea. And what you should really be doing for, is kind of looking for a, um, a better kick drum sample, right? Now, I personally like when there's a nice, right, like snap and kind of a little bit of like grit on top of the kick. Um, something also to be really aware of is like understand what kind of bass line you're going to be making, right? So are you going to be making a bass line that's going to be like short and punchy? Is it going to hit on downbeats with the kick or is it going to hit in between, right? So that's going to determine how long you want the decay of your kick drum to be. So one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they pick a kick drum with a really long decay and they have a bass line that's really busy. And then they wonder why they can't get their track to sound, uh, you know, clean. Well, it's because the bass elements are fighting, right? So your mix is already going to become better or worse just purely based on the sound choices that you make early on in your project. So I'm going to go ahead now and actually write a bass line. Um, yeah, write a bass line. I'm going to do that on my mini log because it's right here and I don't feel like walking over to those synths right now because I'm lazy. Uh, so I'm tracking this through, let's see, through here. And any of you guys that have tuned in at all to my past episodes know that I love analog preamps, right? So I'm pulling everything in through a preamp to make it nice and juicy and warm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to load my external MIDI instrument, right? And this allows me to control my synthesizer as if it's in the computer in terms of MIDI. So let's go ahead and create a little 
MIDI clip. Oh, sorry, actually, I'm not going to create a MIDI clip. I'm going to play with the bass line and then see if I come up with something cool. So I got my mini log right here to my left. Let's see, why are we not coming in? Ah, because we're not plugged in, that's why. Well, that'll do it. There we go. Cool, 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 cool. So that's already a pretty nice sound. Let me mess with this a little. So, playing with my left hand because my right hand's a little bit messed up. As you can hear, I'm not <laughs> the greatest with my left hand, but I got an approximation of what I needed. So, I'm going to come in here. Let's see this. That's a nice one. So one thing that's important to do is to get your gain structure locked in right at the beginning of the track. So one of the number one things that's going to make mixing way easier for you is this thing that I just brought up called gain structure. So what is gain structure? Okay. Gain structure is basically how loud signals are at each step of the process, also known as gain staging. Right. And so basically if my kick is already the most dominant thing in my mix, right, it's a house track. My kick is supposed to be the most dominant. Then I should record my bass at a volume that already is complementary to that kick drum, right? So that's pretty friendly right around there. I'm just going to mess with the sound a little bit more.
So I like that a lot. So I'm going to go ahead and track that in. And it's at like a pretty friendly volume against my kick. Right, I'm going to put nine, my bad. That sounds pretty good. Okay, great question, uh, TWD Industries. So, okay, so what I mean by complementary is a couple things, right? So, we have to remember with, especially with house music, right? Or with any music that has a four on the floor kick drum, that's, we're, that we'll call contemporary, okay? Because that's usually going to mean it's going to be a heavy kick. Uh, what that means is that there's going to be a huge emphasis on those downbeats, right? Both rhythmically and tonally. So what I mean by tonally is that like there's going to be it's going to be really physically heavy at those points, um, and so what you want is is kind of based on like the tonal or timbral sound of your kick drum, like the tone, the timbre we'll call it, right? That's what you really call it, which basically just means like the tonal quality of it, right? What identifies it as the sound. Um, you want your bass drum to kind of like play off of it, right? So if I have a snappy kick drum, which this is not overly snappy, but it's pretty snappy. What's kind of happening is I have a little bit of like snappiness to my, my bass, but just like a little bit, right? Just a little bit of air on top so that they're actually talking to each other, it sounds like, right? Uh, and in terms of Sure. Okay. I could demo what it would sound like at an unfriendly gain level. Let's do that also. So when I'm talking about like a, uh, a friendly gain level, first of all, what I mean by that is that for my mix, it's already not too loud. So if I solo this right now, literally all I have is a kick peaking at about negative five. All right. And so if I, when I introduce the, the, um, the bass, it gets a little louder. Now, if we listen to the kick alone, or the bass alone, you'll see that the bass is actually quieter, significantly quieter than the kick, right? So all that I mean is, is that it's good to track your bass so that it's actually at the level. Well, my mouse just bugged out. So that it's actually at a level that you already would be mixing it at. What that means is, is that instead of having to adjust the fader to get the level right, I'm actually recording it so the sound wave is at the right level. So here's what it sounds like at a bad level. Like that's just way too loud. And that's too low, right? That's too quiet. I'm gonna have to crank it a lot and I might not even actually have enough headroom. So a good, a good sound level is that a friendly sound level right all it means is that I'm coming in and it's sounding nice and uh, tight with the kick drum against it not too loud not too quiet against it so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to also I don't actually have a patch bay which is a little frustrating um, but what I do have is some really nice outboard gear. So I'm going to actually apply some tracking compression to this bass. As I, or actually, you know what? No, let's do that in the box. Let's do that in the box because you guys can't see that. So yeah, what I'll do is, is I'll just re hit record here and I'll get my bass sound. Now, the reason I'm letting it play for so long, right, is because, as you can hear, there's a little bit of, like, clickiness that happens sometimes, right? And, like, the actual bass sound is not completely consistent, which has to do with the analog architecture of the synth that I'm recording it from, right? So what I'm actually going to do is 
uh, I'm going to just find the best version of the loop and then loop that out. So instead of using this entire part, I'm just I'm going to find the best part. So I centered it on this point. A, because it sounded good against the kick, right? So I would never do this in isolation because the whole point is that I want to already get my, optimize my mix, right? So I want it to sound good against the kick. One of the reasons that... Great question, Avon. It's the latter, right? So you want to use... So like if you're, this is dance music. This is electronic music, right? This should be your pillar in terms of loudness, right? So relatively speaking, you're going to turn other things down against them. What ultimately may happen is the project might get a little too loud and you have to turn everything down. But the whole point is that this relationship is actually intact from the second you start producing so that you, have, you don't have to constantly be adjusting and not adjusting and all this stuff, right? Um, anyway, so what I'm hearing right here is the least amount of snappiness. Sounding pretty smooth, which is nice. So I'm just going to go like that and loop it out. Ah, okay. So what I'm getting here is some snapping. And so what that means is that actually the, yeah, so the sound is starting a little sooner. So what I might do. Let's actually delete all of these. And now I would just see logic is cool, just in the same way that Ableton is, where it's going to be smart and it's going to know that I made an adjustment. So what it's going to do is, is at the start of each of these, I'm going to have that fixed. So I shouldn't get any snapping sounds when the audio cuts out. Beautiful. So now it's super smooth. So one thing I might do is a lot in house music, uh, it can be in dance music. It can be useful sometimes to apply a little bit of compression to the bass. Um, not because we want to really like, you actually don't want to apply that much compression to bass, but what I would use this for would be literally just to control the absolute peaks. So that's a little bit more uh, flat. So what I'll do is, is I'll drag on this plugin from Acoustica, which is one of my favorite companies, called uh, L Ray. It's an amazing compressor. And I'll put it on zero latency mode so that when I'm tracking, uh, I'm still able to not have latency. This is the cool thing about these plugins. They're super high CPU. So I'm gonna make my release very fast. I'm going to make my sidechain filter up to about, say, yeah, 100. So I don't compress any of the um, low end material that really makes the bass chubby. And then I'll make my attack pretty slow. So all that I'm trying to do here is just grab any extraneous information that might be like uneven, right? So for those who don't fully understand what compression is, all it does is it levels out volume, right? So it reduces the loudest peaks. That's what it responds to, and it actually automatically reduces it. So you can just think of a compressor as a really complex gain knob. slower attack so literally all that i'm doing right now a good way to approach compression on bass is you don't want to actually compress the low the low material right so 
it looks like I'm not compressing anything about above below like 110 or 115 or something, which is nice because that's where the roundness and weight of the base comes from. Um, but what I am doing is I'm taking some of that higher material and I'm leveling it out, right? So that it doesn't jump out so much. And so it's a little bit more like flat, which is a good thing because for, for dance music, right? You want there to be this consistent rhythm, at least in this style of dance music, I should say. Now what I might also do, since this is an analog bass sound, and analog tends to be a little bit bottom heavy. Um, whoop, okay. I'm gonna cut everything out below 20 hertz. And it should actually also make a little more room for the kick. So we're sounding pretty nice right there. Um, I might even real quickly drag on an Isotope RX D-Click plugin just to see if we can get something. that clickiness that sounds pretty nice let's get rid of it Maybe I'll turn my kick down just a tad. That sounds nice. Okay, so co I actually don't fully understand your question, Cozy, um, or sorry, Cosmic, Cosmic J. Um, doesn't the filter on the compressor act on the side chain, not the program material? Okay, you know what? This is a great question. Okay, this is a really good question. So this is a point of confusion, especially because of contemporary production techniques. So side chain doesn't mean what you think it means in this context. Uh, so I'm really glad you asked this question. So what a sidechain filter is, is it actually is saying it's, it's an internal structure in the compressor. This has nothing to do with the kick drum or anything else. What the sidechain filter is saying is do not compress anything below 110 hertz. So that way it doesn't get attenuated, right? So a side chaining right, is a production technique where you use an external sound source to trigger the compressor. And in fact, if I applied a filter to that side chain, which this would not do, by the way, that's not what this does, but you can do that. You'd have to do it with multiband compression. But um, you could make it so that it only responds to things above like 200, for instance, right, so that it only would duck the top. But what I'm actually doing here is I'm just saying, whenever you see filter or side chain, in a compressor plugin, right, and you're not routing it externally, what that actually means is you're creating literally a side chain, right? So what side chain actually means is that imagine two signals traveling, right, in the compressor. The side chain actually breaks off part of the signal to a side signal, right, hence side chain. And so what the filter determines is what frequencies get sent into that side chain, right, so that 
everything under 110 hertz doesn't get compressed and then gets summed back together with all the stuff that does get compressed. So that's, that's why I did that, so that I could tighten the bass. So again, I'm not compressing the low end because I don't want to re actually redu reduce it, but I am compressing some of the, like, the low mids and everything above to be able to just tighten it up a little bit. Really good question, though, because it's a huge point of confusion. I hope that that cleared it up. If it didn't, um, then, then let me know. So what I'm now going to do is I'll throw in a, a clap of some sort. Or actually, I'm going to do some snare drums. So again, I'm kind of I'm trying to uh, no, I I don't have it confused because what you'll see is, is if I roll the filter down, more compression is applied and low frequencies are louder than high frequencies. So no disrespect whatsoever, but I think you have it backwards. Um well, I'd rather I know you have it backwards. Uh, anyway, so here we go. Snares. All right. Alrighty, um, so yeah, I'm gonna retract these snares, and again, I'm, um, I am gonna make sure that the gain structure is solid, right? So I'm bringing them in at a level that is uh, proportionate to these. Maybe a little louder. All right, so here we go. <sighs> okay, so again, I only need a couple of instances of those. So as you can see, right, I'm trying to take as much time as possible to design the sound. Okay, so let's actually, I don't need that money. So that it fits in perfectly, right? So I actually have to do less and less mixing. Now what I might do also is real quick, just like apply the Haas effect to make it wide. nice 
Anyway, so now the drums are out wide. So again, this is actually, as much as it's a production thing, it's also a mixing thing. Um, you know, manipulating the stereo field is kind of one of those hazy areas that's in between production and mixing. But the bottom line is, right, is that all that mixing is, is it is trying to present the music in the most effective way possible, right? In the most exciting way possible also, depending on the type of music, but definitely with dance music, right? You want the beat to like jack. So if you can manipulate the stereo field, you also can actually be creating a kind of like um, motion rhythm, right? Rhythm in the stereo field, right? So rhythm is all about juxtaposition, right? It's about um, not just when two things happen in response to one another, but also about tonal juxtaposition, right? So when something that's like muted plays, something that's a little bit brighter will respond. So with the bass, what's cool about this is, um, is that we have the low bass, right, acting which is like a lower sound, and then the snare is a little bit more open. It's also like going in between, right? This, it's syncopating, this note, and then this note is hitting right here. So not only are we juxtaposing the tones, right? And a little bit also the timing, and having them like play off and then overlap, which is a cool thing to do with rhythm, really kind of how rhythm is created we're also separating them so we're like accentuating that rhythmic differentiation so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to bring in some chords on my profit what key am I working I already forgot So I'm in C minor. It's actually kind of weird. So let's just external MIDI this. So what I'm gonna do is now, right? Is I'm I'm just mirroring the boom, but I'm going on the um on my profit. that from the last two um
like that one. That one sounds good. That final one. So I also I set up the um, the filter on my synth so that it is close and then open. So it's that very subtle down there, right? Now, something I'm actually going to do is I'm going to separate these two um, chord stabs onto two different tracks. But you might be wondering, why would I do that? Well, the reason is, is that I'm going to pan them again in the same way, one down the middle and one out wide. So instead of cutting it and having to like, you know, fade some of the uh, decay from the original one, um, this way I'm going to be able to just separate them uh, immediately and literally have them on separate tracks. So check this out. So I'm doing the same thing I did with the mini log. Where I'm waiting for the best one to happen and it just happened, which was right there. At least in my opinion, that one sounded the sweetest. So I'm just going to go ahead. Oh, excuse me. So I'm just going to go ahead. All right, now I'm going to do the, still, let's just call this like high stab. Even though it's the same octave, in my brain, it's like there's, it's opening up, right? So it's going to be a little higher. So now I'm just going to do the opposite thing on my MIDI. So now I'm only tracking this one. I'm going to put this one out wide. So I really like these last three. That's four. These last three that happened. So I'll drag these over. There's actually this slight difference between these two, where this one's a little more open. And that one feels a little more closed. So I'm literally just going to drag this one like that. Oh, excuse me. So we have this slight little difference in articulation between the two, which is always nice. And again, we'll go like this. So a couple things now, again, some mixing on the fly stuff. This low stab is now happening 
all on there's this down this downbeat this first downbeat right i've stacked the downbeat with with sounds which is fine but you just have to make sure that you clean them out of the way of each other so right now the kick and the bass are out of the way of one another it's fine right we have that that transient cut right through when i introduce the low stab it's like a little bit murky so what i'm going to do is again this came from analog synth which usually means that there's kind of some like low frequency gook which can be cool but in this case i don't want it i don't need that sound to be like full because the bass is already filling out those low frequencies so what i'll do is is i'll probably filter this up to like a hundred It's really subtle now. And we're not really losing that much, but you can hear all that whoom that's down there. Excuse me. So what I'm going to go ahead and do now is track some a hi hat pattern. Let's see. That's pretty easy, right? And so this the the mixing that I'm doing with this hi-hat pattern. Um, is the mixing is actually happening on the the uh excuse me, uh, drum machine itself. I'm going to tighten it up that hat a little like that that's supposed to I like that so what I'm gonna do is is on every fourth sequence I'm gonna have it go so you'll hear that happen I'm just going to do that manually on the actual drum machine. So that's all I need, right? And again, I'm bringing in the hi-hat friendly level. Don't really need to adjust the volume too much. Like, you know, down the road, sure, maybe I'll like very, we're, we're talking like, you know, maximum one decibel adjustments. Now one thing that's happening is the hi-hats and the snares overlap, which I did on purpose. So that I can create a little bit of more interesting like tone on top, a slight tonal variation on top of the snares, right? Because it goes... Right? Like this. 
and it, that couples on top of the snares. So it creates this very subtle little tweak in feel. Now something that's cool to do is there's a plugin called Track Spacer. This is really cool. This is like a dynamic EQ as a sidechain, or really applying dynamic EQing to sidechain essentially. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose my input as my snares. And what this allows me to do is it allows me to duck only the frequencies that the snares are triggering, right? So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to only duck the high frequencies, like everything above 5,000 on the hi-hats, just for these parts, right? Because the snares are actually doing those themselves. So it'll create a cooler texture. And this ratio just determines how much it ducks. So I'm going to test it out. So as you can see, it's only ducking right there, which is super nice. So one final thing I might do, and then I got to unfortunately jump because I am a busy man today. Um, I'm going to... record some sort of sustained pad external MIDI what are we doing from my profit 8 or the ref 2 So what I'm doing here now is I'm just going to bring in my uh, profit through a guitar pedal to give it a little bit of life and movement, make it a little more of an interesting tone. Ooh, that was aggressive, sorry.
let's see what that did. Whoops. Yeah, so since let's do that. That sounds great. And I'm gonna go ahead. So I'll record this for the entire length of the 16 bars. Let's hear it. That's pretty nice. So in terms of, again, a mixing on the fly, kind of preparing mixing thing, I'm going to, um, I cut, I did a low cut on the actual preamp, which you can do on these Universal Audio uh, 710s on the Twinfinity, um, just to, again, try to make space for the stuff below it. So I just threw in a nice little shift there at the end. Um, with a little sweep of the high pass filter. I mean, sorry, low pass. All right, so now I'm, you know, ready to start going really with like arranging this thing. And unfortunately, I don't have time to do that today, but maybe we can get into that a little bit next time. Um, but as you can already hear, like, it's not completely mixed, but it sounds pretty nice, right? And that's just from doing a couple little things, right? So I did like a little bit of compression on my bass, right? a little bit of cleanup on the low end. Um, I put my snares out wide, so it makes it feel alive, right? I actually did a little bit of ducking with my hats against the snares for those frequency ranges. Took the low stab, also cut out some of that material. High stab, just kept it out wide, and now I got this guy. Now if I look at this, I might real quick need to still take out more low, low end material. I can hear the kick really coming through every time. And I can actually probably turn up the pad. Like one thing I could do real quick just to like make it extra nice. And then I got, and then I really got to leave. <laughs> I just have so much fun doing this. Um, is I could apply a little bit of mid side EQ to the sides just to give I, I ducked the I ducked it at a hundred right overall nice little scoop out but if I give it a little bit of love at like 300 or so maybe even 200 it should just make it lift a little bit more let me turn you on this is also from Acoustica it's a pretty cool plugin I'd say 300 eh. oh that's giving me a shelf now 
Yeah, let's try it about 220. That should be nice. That's making it really nice now, out wide. So don't be afraid if you have a nice EQ to really go for it in terms of EQing. That's totally fine. Um, it really fills out that sound. That makes it super round and like pleasing. So hear it one more time. Yeah, so unfortunately, that is all the time that I have for today. Um, but thank you, everyone, who tuned in. Again, I'm Lewis Beck. Uh, I hope that today's session was helpful and useful into showing you how you can kind of start getting closer to your finished product just from the get-go, right? One of the biggest kind of, I think, mistakes that you know up-and-coming producers make or you know intermediate producers and amateur producers are making is... Um, they think that, oh, I'll fix it later, right? Oh, I'll just choose a better sound later or fix it later. Don't do that. Spend the time to get exactly what you need at the start and you'll actually finish tracks quicker. Instead of racking your head about, oh man, I can't get that sound right, get it right in the beginning. Right? That's my philosophy at least. Um, and hopefully as you can see, like it, it ends with some nice results. Um, anyway, th that was really fun for me. I loved that track. Uh, I loved that feeling. That was a nice one. Um, again, thank you everyone who contributed in the chat. I always appreciate your guys feedback and comments and everything like that. Um, and please, 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 you know, keep tuning in to 343 Labs TV. Uh, we have a really cool giveaway going on. Uh, so just stay tuned for that. And uh, if you liked what you saw, please hit the subscribe button. It's somewhere. I can't remember where. Maybe it's down there. Or down there. I'm not sure. Uh, nonetheless, I look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, if you want to learn more about 343 Labs and the classes that we have to offer and all the other cool things that we're doing in our community, please go to 343labs.com. And uh, yeah, so long. See you next week. <laughs>